Okay, so hello everyone and welcome back to what I think now is our fifth episode or sixth episode of this uh, philosophy slash dark horse combination. Uh, my name is Asaf. I'm a coach and owner of Dark Horse Coaching. Um, and along with my close friend, Paul Muffet, we have these podcasts for you to enjoy. Uh, we talk about things uh, that are more related to the amateur athlete. Um, and uh, if you're in that category, you know, of the beer league racer who just uh, works really hard, but then also likes to enjoy uh, the sport and not maybe take it too, too seriously, um, then that's, then you're in the right podcast. Um, so the thing is, even though, you know, we want to keep things fun, but we want, we do take everything very seriously and we want to train as good as we can. Um, it is important that from time to time we share some ideas and thoughts about how to do that better and optimize our performance. So today I wanted to have a bit of a discussion on um, periodizing your diet. So we use a periodized approach for many of our athletes. Uh, periodized meaning that we have different times of the year that we focus on different elements of their fitness uh, in order to uh, maximize their performances. Now, this is an approach that's been around for quite some time now. It's extremely popular. Um, you can hear more about it. Um, and we also incorporate a periodized model uh, using a polarized approach. So if you want to hear more about it, you can Google uh, Steven Seiler. Um, you can also look at uh, uh, Iserin, um as a, a researcher who's done a lot of work in that field. Uh, so it's been around for a long time. But the thing is, uh, it's mostly been looked at through what you need to do as far as your training. But one of the discussions that came up recently is uh, what do you do with your diet? Is this something that you can actually use the same model to maximize your performance? So I'm going to make a very quick video on some of the thoughts uh, and opinions about it. And I'm going to use um, a small piece that uh, a close friend of mine wrote. Um, his name is Michael Rosenblatt. He's a PhD candidate from the University of Toronto who now lives in the Vancouver area. Um, and luckily for me, I get a chance to talk to him on a weekly basis and just brainstorm on ideas along with my other close colleague, uh, Jim Arnold. So um, this time we talked about this uh, um, periodized approach for, for diet. Now, what does it mean? So during different times of the season, we focus on different types of intensities. Now, these different intensities essentially um, require or use um, fuel or calories in a different way, okay, substrates in a different way. Um, calories probably isn't the best word for it, so let's just stick to substrates. Um, so we have fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Uh, there's also ketones, which we'll touch upon. Um, but those are the primary sources of fuel that we have. Now, if we uh, look at each of those individually, we see that fats is something that uh, we have a lot more stored in our bodies. Um, some may say, unfortunately, but you know, that's just a part of the game. Uh, and actually, they are extremely beneficial when it comes to endurance sports, okay? So having fats around is a great thing when you're an endurance athlete. Uh, everything in moderation, obviously, so too much is never a great thing. Uh, too little isn't a great thing either. So it is important to have them in your diet and in your, um, in your kind of holistic program of how much you eat and how much you train to maximize your performance. Carbohydrates is something that we normally use for high intensity training, for races and stuff like that. So that's still a big part of our, uh, of our intake. And protein, of course, is imperative for recovery. Um, now, the carbohydrates can be substituted with ketone bodies. Um, but that's a whole different discussion. So I'm not going to focus too much upon the ketogenic diet, but I will point, I'll put it out there just a little bit as an, as an option to use. Now, the purpose of this discussion isn't to give you a recipe, okay? We're not, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not going to touch upon any of that. just want to talk a bit about the physiology and, and how that uh, can be implemented as far as uh, an applied setting. So uh, being an applied physiologist or considering myself as an applied physiologist, I want to take the science and apply it to you so that you can take it and run with it. 
or ride with it, whatever. Um, so let's start off with the basics. As far as training in a periodized model or a polarized model, um, we use low intensity training as a major component in our in our uh, program. So it constitutes roughly 90% of our uh, time spent training. Um, and uh, we normally we, we kind of declare it as a zone one uh, level of training. If we look at whatever, if you look at the three zone model, okay? So to simplify it, we have a zone one, low intensity. Okay, 90% of the time, that's where you spend, that's what you do. Then uh, the other uh, point is zone two, and that one is more of a sweet spot, tempo, um, where you spend uh, a lot of time when you race, um, and it's really a moderate to high intensity zone. So, uh, you know, kind of on a scale, it's probably from one to 10, as far as an effort, it's up to an eight, I would say, um, six to eight, give or take, maybe, maybe four to eight, okay. Um, uh, but six to eight, probably just to be on the safe side. Anyway, that's a part where supply and demand is being met. Supply and demand of what? Well, the currency that we normally use in endurance sports or in general in humans is oxygen. So when you have a match between supply and demand of oxygen and during exercise, that's usually around that spot of zone two uh, where we can still think straight and we can still go for a fairly long amount of time up to about an hour um, but the rate at which we start to deplete precious fuel sources like carbohydrates starts to increase uh, dramatically so now we're, we can't rely solely on fats we never really rely on one thing and not the other but at this point uh, the increase in carbohydrate utilization increases dramatically so that's kind of zone two. And I'm just running through these. So, you know, I'm probably not including a lot of this stuff, making a few errors along the way. So please bear in mind uh, that I'm just trying to condense everything into a short podcast. The last zone is zone three. Uh, for me, that's kind of the three zone model. That's what I like to use. Some I use five or six, but for the sake of this podcast, I'm going to use three. That's the severe domain. It's unsustainable for very long duration of time. We're talking minutes. Um, uh, and during that time, the reason why it's unsustainable is because the, f the rate at which you're using the fuel source is very fast um, and the supply cannot meet the demand. Okay, it's just impossible. You become very acidic. Um, you are basically everything is jacked up to 10, right? So you're breathing very fast. Uh, everything is hurting. You can't sustain that for a very long period of time. And once you reach exhaustion, uh, sorry, exhaustion comes on very, very quick at that point. So um, as far as the fuel you're using during each of these domains, it varies widely. So if you have zone one training, for example, prescribed for you that day, you're primarily, your primary source of fuel, depending on how long you'll go for, is fat. Now, if you go up to a higher intensity, carbohydrates become more of a source. And then the higher up you go, it becomes more of a primary fuel source versus fat. So th when you think about that model, the question comes up as to what should I eat when at different times of the year, I spend more, more time at zone one or in specific times of the year, I use more zone two or zone three. Do I need to tailor my diet to suit those types of intensities? What my friend, uh, Michael Rosenblatt is suggesting is yes, you should definitely consider that. So the reason for that is um, fat is if you rely more on fat as an endurance athlete, you're essentially becoming more efficient. Um, you, it's something that we have stored in our bodies. It's uh, more readily available. Uh, our bodies does love to use carbohydrates more than it loves to use fat, um, but if you have the ability to access fat more uh, quickly, then you're going to spare some of those uh, precious glycogen storages for a time where you really need it. So teaching your body to do that, you can actually train it to engage uh, uh, those fatty acids, those fat molecules more quickly at the onset of a ride, and that will basically make you more uh, efficient. Um, so how do you do that? How do you actually 
train your body to in access those fat storages more quickly during a ride at times of the year that you want that to be the case. Um, and actually, it's kind of like you want that to be the case throughout the season, but obviously during different times of the year, you can't just rely on fat, so you will have to use carbohydrates and you want it to be as efficient as possible as well. So there's always a bit of a trade-off between the two. Now, one of the ways that you can improve your efficiency uh, of and use more fat earlier on is using either a fat diet and from his recommend or his readings, it looks like 80% of the diet should be comprised of fat. Um, again, what types of fat and stuff like that, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, it is uh, a very large amount of your diet is coming from fat. Very low amount is coming from carbohydrate and obviously protein is included in it as well. Um, so if you do that, um, the benefits are that you're just storing muscle, uh, storing uh, fat inside the muscle and then it really can become more readily available once you get into uh, your exercise. Um, there's also molecules, uh, signaling molecules that become more uh, activated when you have a high fat diet. Um, I'm not going to go into details in that at all because it's really complex but but the idea is that those signaling pathways essentially tell your muscle okay we're starting to work let's get those fat molecules and start to use them up as energy um, so it's not just storing but it's also how you how well you can utilize them now another way is a ketogenic di diet which I said I'm not going to go into too much detail but the same principle applies. So it's very high on fat, high on protein, not very high on carbohydrate. But what you do end up with a ketogenic diet is you have ketone bodies that substitute the carbohydrates to provide you with those precious um, uh, molecules that the body does like and can use for higher intensities. They're not as good as, uh, as a carbohydrate-rich diet, so uh, don't expect to go as fast and be as powerful as you are on a solely ketogenic diet. But um, if you prefer to use that diet for, again, uh, moderate to low intensities times of the year, that is a possibility. Everything warrants, by the way, in this podcast, everything you attempt to do is, requires uh, self-experimentation. Okay, I'm just going to put it out there. So don't take what I say as, okay, I'm going to, ketogenic diet is my way because of stuff said so. No, you need to, to try what works best for you. Um, then um, during other times of the year um, where you need to have a higher um, intensity included in your training, mixing up carbohydrates again is probably a good idea. Um, now, as far as how to do it, um, the recommendation that has been shown uh, by some of the literature that Michael has been able to collect here um, talks about um, really uh, if we focus on one of the uh, times of the year, for example, uh, let's look at maybe a... So during the base phase and during the times we, we train at lower intensities, we want to have a high fat. During the times that we have uh, races, or higher intensity, we want to focus on um, mixing some carbohydrates in it. But there are times of the year where just nailing down the right amount is essential. So uh, let's talk about a taper period. Okay, so the taper period um, is, or pre-competition, is a time where you want to maximize your performance. You've done all this work, you've been training, you had a massive training block, um, and now you're tired, but you also want to arrive at the race with maximum performance. You want to be fresh, you want to be well recovered, and you want to have enough glycogen in the system, in your muscles, to be able to engage it and use it when the time is needed. Um, so uh, in order to do that, it's not necessary to eat carbohydrates for the same amount of time that you actually have the taper period in your training. So a taper period is anywhere from one week to three weeks normally, uh, following a very big block of training. Um, and for that, you don't need to start eating carbohydrates three weeks in advance uh, at a higher amount. That's You don't need to do carbo loading for three weeks. Carbo loading or increasing the amount of glycogen storages uh, in your 
um, muscle and um, lever's ability to to store them as well. It takes, according to the literature, anywhere from uh, 24 to 36 hours. So uh, carbo loading is something that you can basically do the day or two days before, and that should be sufficient. Um, the thing is, again, if you do a very strict diet beforehand, bear in mind that um, the ability to use that uh, glycogen, break it down to glucose and turn it into ATP will not be as efficient as if you have a diet that does include carbohydrate um, more regularly. Um, and therefore, some experimentation is still required and really depends on the type of event you want to do. So if it's a longer event, long duration, you still want to have those access to those fat storages earlier on, maybe you want to go easy on the carbs. But if it's a crit or something of that nature, that's very explosive or a road race, that's not too, too long. Perhaps it is important to get your body used to carbohydrate uh, intake earlier on during the taper period. So definitely some experimentation is, is necessary. Um, before we go any further, I'm just going to touch upon one thing that's very interesting and should be pointed out is that there are significant differences between men and women. So it's been shown that because of estrogen, women tend to use 50% less uh, carbohydrates for uh, energy than men. Men rely heavily on carbohydrates compared to women, um, and women are much more efficient at oxidizing fat, fatty acids. So um, with that in mind, between men and, and women, that experiment really needs to happen. So you need to be aware of that. And if you work with a coach and you see that they may not take that into consideration, maybe you should ask them to you know, tell you more, read more, get more information about that, and really try to kind of um, incorporate that into your own training, what works best for you. So, uh, Obviously, there's many individual differences between uh, different riders, but between men and women, that's a big difference. So definitely think about that um, for what works best for you. As far as protein consumption, um, not much to say about that. If you uh, consume more protein than you need to, um, it will just be converted into glucose. We don't store glu uh, protein in our muscles like fat or carbohydrates, I'm sorry, glycogen. Um, and um, you do need to consume protein. Probably the best time to do that is post-exercise. So pre, uh, during, hasn't been shown to improve performance, um, not to the extent uh, that's... Uh, that as far as I, I know, uh, nothing too significant, but then post-exercise is uh, quite beneficial. So definitely something to bear in mind. But again, if you consume too much, it's just going to get converted to glucose. So um, going back to how and when to consume different things. As far as competition, uh, so we talked about pre-competition. Let's talk about competition. This is a very interesting topic because competition, it depends on the time of the competition. So if you've done a good job training your body to utilize fat early on, and you are training for something like a very long race, long event, a few hours long, more than an hour, um, then it's really more about how you built yourself up towards that event than actually what you're going to do on the day of, so or the few days before. So you can still play with uh, tapering your diet, like I suggested, but during the, the ride, you still have to consume quite a few calories. So that should be a mix between uh, glucose and fructose, kind of a two to one ratio to really get the most um, um, energy as you can from those substrates as much as you can. We are rate limited. We can't consume as much as we want and just expect everything that we consume will just go straight into uh, the muscle. That's not the case. Uh, we are limited by how much uh, grams of um uh, um, glucose and fructose we can actually break down if you do a good job of mixing them up we're talking about 360 kilo kilocalories per hour so if it's just glucose you're limited by around 240 kilo uh, calories per hour so the extra fructose gives you about a 30 percent bump so just you know play around with that and see uh, what works best for you, but really we're talking primarily about carbohydrate intake during races. Um, the thing that's interesting is what happens below one hour. So if you have a 10K run or um, 
a crit or a time trial, something like that. Um, if it's a time trial, let's say if it's a 40K time trial, uh, you want to think about something that's quite interesting and that's the oral, uh, uh, sorry, the effect of, um, of uh, eating carbohydrate or drinking carbohydrates orally. You know, obviously for most of that, us that is the case uh we don't just ride around with something stuck in our vein but um in studies that have used that they've shown that uh there there is an en um uh, enzymatic uh response that occurs in the mouth when you consume uh, carbohydrates and it has a effect on how the brain senses that it it has the fuel readily available to it so just by having a mouth rinse with carbohydrates can basically tell your brain, okay, I have the fuel source available, let's go. Um, and if you don't have it in the same way, if you have it intravenously, for example, you miss out on that. So uh, that on its own is a very interesting mechanism. So if you do have that short of a race that's less than an hour long, if you have some sort of a drink mix, um, in your mouth and you just kind of uh, um, mouth rinse, um, then it can actually have an effect on how hard you can go. So it's just worth bearing in mind um, that that could be kind of a nice trick to do that. That pretty much brings us to the conclusion of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't want to go too far into the weeds in any of these topics. Topics. Each of these uh, points, pre-competition, post -com uh, post competition recovery, uh, during competition, carbs versus fat versus ketogenic diet versus all those things can be explored in their own different episode or episodes. Um, but I just wanted to give you this insight over thinking about how I need to look at my diet to best improve my performance during different times of the year where I train differently. So if I train at lower intensities, maybe I want to have something that's harder to break down, a substrate that's harder to break down in order for my body to train itself um, to become more efficient. And then when I get to the races or the times where I train uh, at higher intensities, whether it's uh, at intensities that equal VO to max or um, you know, uh, threshold workouts or super threshold workouts, it is worth thinking about incorporating, incorporating more carbohydrates and different types of carbohydrates um, into your uh, ride uh, um, food and then also pre and post as well. Uh, the one thing I didn't touch upon, I'll just uh, mention it, is there are two techniques that you can try to employ in order to increase um, the efficiency or the uh, time where you start to utilize fast during your ride. One of the ways is to do a um, ride in the morning without breakfast. That's one of the ways to do it. Um, it. It should be a very short ride, no longer than an hour and shouldn't be hard. But what you do is you wake up and you go. You wake up, glass of water, and you just go. Um, I've I have seen some discussions that perhaps black coffee or, or uh, some sort of coffee can be can kind of boost that a little bit to help you access those uh, fatty acids more rapidly. But regardless, the approach is without uh, consuming any breakfast. You come back, you get your breakfast, you start the, the day, and then you may want to do another workout that's more of your kind of target workout for that day. Now, those are very long days, so you can't do that every single time. You probably shouldn't. You want to do that, you know, just once or twice a week. Probably start with one, see how that goes. Um, and then the other approach, which is slightly modified, is to do an evening ride, um, after which you have very low carbohydrate intake, uh, if any at all. And then you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, and you go out for your ride again. Now that's kind of a modified approach. In both cases, you'll be teaching your body on how to utilize fat more more quickly. Um, going out with a glycogen depletion state um, essentially not only engages uh, fat oxidation more uh, earlier on, but also, again, those signaling molecules will become uh, more efficient at breaking down the fat. 
So uh, that's those are two interesting approaches you can play around with a little bit. Again, just because it works for you one time a week doesn't mean it's going to work for you if you do it every single day. So again, these are recommendations, suggestions. I would definitely er encourage you to go out and do some more readings upon on them before you uh, decide to incorporate it fully into your training program. Experiment, see what works, talk to your coach and see what works best for you. And now that we don't have too many events, it's a great time to experiment. You can just try it in your training, go out, check it out. If you don't feel good, stop, don't do that again. Or maybe try a different approach and uh, just go more gradually uh, next time you do it. Anyway, I know it's a big topic. We covered a lot of things. It's a heated topic as well, uh, especially between the different types of uh, diets that are out there, which one is better, which one is better for you. Um, so hopefully we'll touch more upon those as we continue. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for listening. Hopefully uh, you took something out of this. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. We do read those and we enjoy the interaction with you. Um, and if you have any questions, you can fire me an email at info at darkhorsecycling.com. As you can see, it's Dark Horse. Whoops, there we go. Dark Horse without an A. Um, so please head to our website, uh, throw us any questions. Same thing for Paul at Velocity. Uh, please go and check him out as well. If you have any questions directly for him, please feel free to, to send that. He's also on Instagram at Velocity um, and DM him there. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you next time.